Hello, so it occurred to me I haven't done a video of my games room and collection in a while. Um, three or four years, something like that. And in that time I've gained quite a few subscribers and it's possible that those people are not aware that I do more than play video games badly and show you what they look like and maybe review some Chinese, I don't know, Android gaming stuff. Um, yeah, what I've got here is a collection of retro gaming hardware that um, is what I use to record my videos. I don't use emulators, it's all genuine old school hardware. Um, and I've got a room full of it, so I thought I would show you for the benefit of those newcomers. Some of you who've been here for a long time will be familiar with all this. Not much has changed. There are some new items. Um, partly I'm doing this because I've just tidied up in here. It had been getting very, very cluttered to the point you just couldn't move. Um, I've sorted it out. So I'm going to show you around. Excuse me while I take the camera off the tripod. Um, we'll have a quick pan around. You're not going to be able to see it all because I've got a big light just there. I'll move that around in a bit so we can have a look in that corner. But uh, yeah, I'll just talk you through what I've got. Um, PC Engine. Uh, I didn't have one back in the day, but I've had this one for a while. It's um, It's got a SCART mod on it, which if you're familiar with um, my gameplay videos on it, it, it doesn't work especially well in terms of colour reproduction, though that may be because I have my TV settings wrong. I've been tinkering a bit to try and get it looking better. Uh, Virtual Boy. Highly regarded as a mistake by Nintendo. I don't care what the popular opinion is, I love it. Though it does give me a pounding headache. The reports of like migraine type headaches are um, not exaggerated. 20 minutes on this and I'm done for the day. I'll have a headache for the rest of the day. Vectrex. Love it. That's, that's to quote Stan Lee, enough said. Jupiter Ace. Um, Spectrum era 8-bit computer, black and white, I think it's got sound. Um, very limited, very rare. They only made about 8,000 of them. Um, build quality is rubbish. <laughs> Memotech MTX512. 8-bit British made. Lovely. Not an awful lot of software for it, but it is... Graphics chips are, are sort of similar to say MSX or something but the uh, it, I don't know it just seemed to have an incredibly fast CPU uh, games on it will run ludicrously fast if they're not throttled by the programmer it is really nice Enterprise 64 um, supposed to be a Spectrum competitor got trounced by Amstrad it's quite nice um, didn't sell well in the UK most of them got shipped off to Hungary Oryx, Atmos and Oryx 1. 8-bit um, competitors for the Spectrum didn't do especially well. Did, did better in France than in the UK. Amstrad's CPC 464 and 6128. I like these. Um, the capabilities of them, they kind of fall somewhere between the Spectrum and the Commodore 64. Nice colour graphics, fairly decent sound. Nothing spectacular about them in terms of performance, but I do like them. MSX. I've got a couple of MSXs. The Sony Hit Bit and the Toshiba HX10. And then this here. It's not an MSX. It is the Sword M5. It's uh, what known as the CGL M5 in the UK. Japanese... I don't know what you'd call it. It's sort of similar in some ways to the MSX, but it's not an MSX. There's not an awful lot of software for it. I kind of like it. Atari. We've got a few Ataris here. Five one eh, Atari 520STE. If I can just get it right. Um, 65XE. And then moving down, 600XL, 
XEGS, I love this. I mean, a consoleized Atari 8 bit computer, but I like that. It's what the um, 5200 should have been, really, because that's effectively what it is. And the Atari portfolio, as seen in Terminator 2. Mattel Aquarius. Oh. It was meant to be a cheap competitor to the Spectrum, but honestly, it's just rubbish. It's, it's, it's one of the worst computers I own. Uh, I only have one game for it, and I think that's quite enough. Mm. Texas Instruments TI-994A. 16-bit, but not from the 16-bit era. It's from the 8-bit era, and the capabilities are largely comparable to the other 8-bit computers, though you feel a little bit of extra oomph here and there on some games. I like it a lot. I think it's, it's cool. Dragon 32, based on Tandy Coco 1 and 2. Is the, the Coco or color computer 1 and the 2. OK, Apple Macintosh PowerBook 1400C. And another Apple Macintosh. This is the SE. It's the 68,000 based black and white. Got a hard drive in it, something like 20 megabytes or something. Under here, EACA Video Genie. Um, it is a... Tandy TRS-80 Model 1 clone. This one is not working particularly well. Um, the, the tape drive on it is uh, not sending data to the motherboard, so it, uh, I can't load any software on it. And there's a uh, Commodore Plus 4 in there, um, not working. It's got a dead TED chip. And then up here, We've got an Amiga 40030 and next to it an Amiga CD32. Both uh, AGA based Amigas, love them. I, I do love me an Amiga. And then of course we've got the Amiga 500. This is the uh, 512K half meg based one. It's an early one. It doesn't have the uh, fat Agnes. Uh, Commodore 64, Commodore C16, Commodore VIC-20, Commodore PET. This is partially working. The motherboard and the monitor and everything work. The keyboard, not so much. Uh, I think it just needs a good clean out. Um, one of the obscure fixes for that is stick it in the dishwasher, which I've not yet got round to doing. I keep thinking I'll do it and then I'm like, <laughs> that, that scares me. And then we got this. This is my pride and joy. It's a Commodore Amiga 1200 in a tower case uh, with the 68060 expansion, well, accelerator card with the SCSI adapter, which is hooked into the CD writer, read writer, whatever. Uh, there's a Buddha and Cat Weasel board attached to a Zorro 2 bus board, which is giving yeah, extra IDE ports and identity floppy drives uh, I've got a what's it called I've got a fast parallel port card for this as well but I've not actually plugged it in because I don't have a use for it anymore I've forgotten what that thing was called mm, anyway Xbox 360 Nintendo Wii original Xbox Dreamcast PS3 my, I hesitate to call it gaming PC because it's not overly powerful. Uh, some dual core 3 gigahertz Pentium based thing. Uh, 750 GT something or other. TI. Graphics card. NVIDIA jobby. And Oculus Rift DK2. Moving up. Acorn could say Archimedes, technically it's not, they dropped the Archimedes name by then, but I think anyone who owns one of these will consider it to be one. It's the A3010. Acorn BBC Micro Model B. Acorn Electron. This was my 
main and in fact only gaming device, computer thing for quite a few years back in the 80s. I'll need to climb up onto a chair to show you what's up. Oh, ah, here we go. Spectrum 48k Spectrum Plus 128k with the toast rack heat sink on the end there. 48k with the rubber keyboard. This is my favourite kind of Spectrum. I know it's the earliest type, but I just love them. And that's got the Div MMC Future from the Future was 8 bit for loading me software. A lovely piece of kit. Sinclair ZX80 and a couple of Sinclair ZX81. One has got the 16k RAM pack plugged into it. Probably not the safest way to store it, but it's like a display. I want to be able to see it, and it's high up and stuff. Um, yeah, Spectrum Plus 2. My least favourite Spectrum, I think, is but ugly. But there you go. Moving uh, along here. Atari Lynx Mark II. Sega Game Gear. Sega Nomad. PC Engine GT and behind that in its case is a Microvision which is like the first handheld oh, I need to dust that this spider's webs it's <laughs> because it's so high up this was the first handheld gaming device with interchangeable cartridges right Gizmondo mistakenly regarded as a piece of junk by some people. This is actually a really good handheld. It was just the company was rubbish. Neo Geo Pocket Color. Lovely. Quickshot Supervision. A Game Boy competitor. Bigger screen. Quite well designed. It's got an interesting hinge thing going on there so you can tilt the screen. Um, but the games on it are pretty meh. Engage, the, the earlier model of Engage. Um, interesting, but very flawed. But still better than this. Gamecom, oh my god. That is the worst gaming device ever made. It's, it's, the ideas were sound. A lot of it, it's got a lot to recommend it, but because the screen is so unbelievably crap in terms of ghosting, um, and, and contrast is just it's unplayable. It's, it's appalling. It's a shame because it could have been good, but they cut corners so badly. And the Bandai Wonder Swan. This is the earlier black and white version. A Game Boy competitor, but uh, kind of too late to the gaming scene, really. Designed by the same guy who designed the Game Boy. I like it. Oops, yeah, and then we have some cheap tat. This is a Lexi book. I don't even know if it has an actual name, but uh, no, it doesn't really have a name. It it plays the kind of things you would expect to find on Facebook, kind of flash type games. It's it's all right. It's the kind of thing you could give your kids to play with if you were driving. A long way somewhere and in a similar sort of way PXP3 shaped like a PSP but, but it's a Chinese knockoff of uh, an app games Mega Drive handheld it's graphically okay the game emulation is okay but the sound is abysmal and then we've got uh, I don't even know what we call that game player yeah um, multi-game emulator thingamajig looks cool but it's rubbish really not good and then uh, PSPs got a PSP fat PSP slim in the case and a PSP go I do I didn't see the point of the PSP go when they first came out but then the uh, custom firmware happened and it's a wonderful thing now and uh, until the uh, G until the, the the advent of the GPD handhelds, that was my portable gaming thingy of choice. Right, some Nintendo stuff. Game Boys, a couple of the original Game Boys. Game Boy Pocket, a couple of Game Boy Colors, Game Boy Advance, 
Game Boy Micro, four GBA SPs, a 3DS and 3DSs, <laughs> or rather DS lights, and then uh, oh god, an At Games Mega Drive handheld. Yeah, piece of junk really. Well, it, it plays the games well enough, but the sound is appalling. And then looking very similar, but actually not the same thing at all, is the third. What's it called? Retro Specs 32. It's a GBA clone and really quite good. It allows you to play GBA games from an SD card. The only downside to this, the buttons aren't really. You don't want your buttons like that for a GBA, but you, that's. Forgivable. Um, the screen is not ideal in that the viewing angle on the horizontal plane is not good. Um, yeah, a game and watch is branded timeout toss up. That is an official, actually, Nintendo ball. They just didn't have a distribution license or whatever back when this was made, so they, they licensed it out to timeout. We have some games and things and bits and pieces here. Cool stuff. Um, NES, little Chinese clone of the uh, NES classic mini thing. And then a uh, PlayStation TV. Not really in good light here, so you can't see it very well. But I mean, it's tiny. It's a tiny, tiny little games console that's really quite capable given its size. Some handheld stuff and MDA Pro. Uh, an interesting thing, given that's the GPD Win, that's the GPD XD. This thing came out in about 2005 ish, 2004, 2005. It is a Windows Pocket handheld computer phone. Um, and it's just really cool. <laughs> it's not very capable, it's kind of sluggish and everything. But for a while, before the iPhone had really be, become the, the monster that it is, this was a great way of getting online out and about. It had internet access, uh, still has internet access if I put a SIM in it. Um, and it's like a little computer with a full QWERTY keyboard and everything, and I like it a lot. I, I did used to use that quite a bit. I always had this thing where I wanted to go on IRC while sitting in a field. And this was the first thing that let me do that. So, yeah, quite cool. Right, I'm going to turn the lighting round so we can see what's behind me. Bear with me. Okay, then in television flashback. It's uh, like a plug and play in television with a load of games built in. 60 games. Mmm. I did a review of that. Actually, I've done reviews of lots of these things. Look in the playlists for my collection and hardware reviews and you'll see many reviews. Uh, ColecoVision, it has got a multi-game cartridge card thing in it. It's a bit kind of primitive by modern standards in that you've got to use all these dip switches to select the games, but it's cheap and it does the job. Uh, Mattel in television, a real one. This one's a little bit poorly. It, it produces the wrong colours. Atari's, four of them. This is the, uh, uh, not really enough light here. There's a heavy sticker. There's the Irish Junior, the all black one. The Long Rainbow Junior and a Vader, which is my favourite of the bunch. More Ataris, a couple of um, 7800s. I bought one, found the video output on it was so really horrible I thought it must be broken, so I bought another one, only to find out that's just how they are in Britain. The PAL emulators on them are appalling, and really I need to do an RF, not RF, composite mod on at least one of these, but I, uh, I'm terrible with the soldering iron, so I haven't dared try yet. Atari Jaguar. I love the Jaguar. The games are rubbish, but it's such an underdog, and I love the underdog. Playstations. A couple of original Playstations. That one's chipped, so I can play um, backups <laughs> of, my, of the CDs. Yeah, and a PS1. Um, 
PlayStation 2s, a couple of fat ones, the original early ones, I just, I don't know how, one of them is the one I had back in the day and the other one I accumulated somehow, and then a slim, um, yeah. And then down here, Amstrad GX4000, <laughs> I'm not a fan of them, and then the um, Commodore 64 GS, which actually is, um, while I'm not a fan of the Amstrad, the, the 64 GS is, is far worse in terms of making sense as a product. It's rubbish because most Commodore 64 games require the use of the keyboard or like the run stop button or some kind of function button that isn't on there. So they had to port the games to it, um, which generally didn't happen. So you, not a lot of games that will run on it. And it's it, they were expensive. It was like, why would you pay money for that? So the result being not many people bought them, which makes them a rarity now, which makes them, they sell for crazy money. I'm not sure exactly what they sell for now. When I was tracking the prices of things, they were selling for like three to four hundred pounds. I bought this for a tenner <laughs> back in about 97 at a car boot sale. So that was a good move. Uh, this is where the light gets poor and makes things difficult. That is a Neo Geo AES. And that is a Panasonic 3DO. I do like me a 3DO. So I wish I could show you yeah, there's just not enough light or room or anything, but uh, it's there. Then we've got a Fairchild Channel F pre-Atari 2600 hardware. Um, people think that the 2600 was the first cartridge-based um, gaming console. Well, this beat it too. I mean, there are those who would say the Magnavox Odyssey, but you, you're getting into... Um, difficult ground there. But anyway, yes, the, um, the the Fairchild Channel F did beat the Atari 2600 to market. This, though, is the Mark II, which came out a little bit later. And in the UK, it was branded Admin Grandstand. Um, licensing deals and stuff to get into the market. Another Grandstand thing. Um, it calls it a Colour Programmable. It's also known as an SD-070. Uh, which was like kind of a hardware standard. I be I'm not sure if there were other things that used it. It's horrible. It's a piece of... I wouldn't say it's a piece of junk, but the games are just not fun. But it's got a fantastic joystick. It's an analogue stick. It looks a lot like an Atari joystick, but it's analogue and it's lovely. And then we've got this thing back here that we can't really see. It's a Radafin 1392. Information on this is limited and not strictly accurate. I've read some things that say it's pre-Atari 2600, but I don't know that that's actually true. And then the uh, Philips Video Pack G7000. Um, I like this. It's quirky and odd, and pretty much all of the software was done by just one guy. Philips were like, they wanted to drop support of it. But he was just single-handedly producing the entire games library for this thing, and it's, it's, it's good. Um, it's, a, it's a pity he didn't have funding and resources and stuff, because... Uh, the capabilities of the machine are greater than the Atari 2600, but, you know, he, he was... He didn't have the time or the funding or whatever to really take advantage of it, but it's uh, it's impressive. I, I do like it. And then we've got a couple of Philips CDIs, a couple of different models, and I can't remember the number, the model numbers from here. Oh, yeah, I can see one of them. CX, CDI 210 on that one. Uh, what's the other one? I can't see. It's too dark, but it's something else. Yeah. Um under here yeah you can't see them but there's a load of famiclone things some are just like built into uh, controllers and some are consoleized things that are just they're tat i'm not even going to pull them out and show you because <laughs> they are yeah, no excuse me while i climb onto my chair again to show you what's up here pong machines Binatone Color TV Game Mark 10. I had one of these back in the day, but it was a different shape to this. But uh, essentially the same console, same joystick, same games. 
Um, DB Master Mark VI is largely the same as that, but with um, paddle controllers instead of joystick type controllers. And then a grandstand, I can't quite read what it is, but uh, that's actually the one I use currently. If I want to play Pong, I use that because it's got the more steady video output. The two binatones, they drift, and that's not what you want when you're playing Pong. Some clone systems, Atari Flashback, a clone of the 2600 and a bit of 7800, but it's, it's just a NES on the chip with ported games and honestly, if you want to play Atari games, don't get one of these. That's, it's just, the joystick's nice, but it's not authentic. At Games Mega Drive, yeah, it's got a lot of built-in games and will run Mega Drive cartridges, most of them. Uh, graphically, you get a bit of glitching, but the sound is appalling. Frankly, don't bother. Uh, Scorpion 8. It is a Famicom clone. It's full size. It's got authentic kind of moulding and everything. The only major difference between this and a Famicom, apart from it's not made by Nintendo, is it's black. And I think it looks really, really cool. I'm not a fan of the NES, but I like this. Um, yeah, maybe it's the goth in me that just likes anything black. Mm. Uh, Sega Master System Mark One. Sega Saturn. Lovely. Um, Right, a couple of Mega Drives. Mega Drive Mark II with Mark II Mega CD and the 32X. I do like the 32X, it's underrated, but it was. It, there are some good games on there. There's an EverDrive cartridge. Um, Mark I Mega Drive with Mega CD. I actually like the way these look a lot more than the Mark II. And then we've got a NES and a SNES. And the... Uh, Super Game Boy cartridge. And then we've got some old school tabletop games. These were a thing when I was in school. Fluorescent, uh, they're not LEDs, fluorescent light thingamajig, I don't know what they're called. But anyway, they're not LEDs, but they light up and they're kind of primitive. Caveman, Invader from Space, Missile Invader and Munchman. Classics. Down here, N64, Nintendo GameCube. And then at the bottom, we've got a, just a load of joy pads from various systems, and I just store them there for convenience. Over here, plug and plays. There we go. Yeah, I've, I've shown some of these recently. That's that um, Star Wars plug and play with like. Uh, yeah. The game itself is not great, but the controller is fantastic because it's, it's all tilt controls and everything and you hold it, it, it controls much the same as the classic Atari Star Wars coin-op did. It's just a shame I didn't have that as the game inside it because that would have been brilliant. Capcom plug and play that I showed recently. Spider-Man plug and play, that's uh, uh, an interesting thing with several Spider-Man based games. Space Invaders, uh, it's got Space Invaders, Phoenix, um, Kicks, uh, a couple of other games I can't remember off the top of my head. A couple of Namco plug and plays. Um, this one is great because pole position. Um, it is the only really playable pole position game I've come across, like Conversion. Because you turn the stick, you twiddle the knob as the steering wheel and it makes it playable. And it's the only really playable version of the game I know. Um, Activision. That is Atari 2600 games by Activision. And it's, it's cool. It's good. And then the uh, C64 DTV. It's a Commodore 64 in a joystick. Which is also a very cool way of playing a load of Commodore 64 games with minimal messing around. That doesn't necessarily have the best games on it. It's still pretty impressive. And uh, obviously we've got a load of games for various systems stashed around the place. 
Uh, yeah, boxes full of... Th these are all like archived. If I've got stuff that's on a, an EverDrive or SD card solution or whatever so I can load them up into a system quickly, the cartridges or cassettes and everything, they, they've gone into these boxes for more convenient storage. So there you go, that is... Um, that's my games room and my collection as it stands at the moment. I'm not used to using this light. <laughs> okay, thank you for watching. Right, hit the subscribe button or I'm getting naked on camera. Go on, do it. Right, you are for it. Ha! Ah, you asked for it. Ha! Ah, ha! Ah, oh.